listen, let's, let's uh, move on to a new area of focus. We've talked about several issues as it relates to the Bible and how we approach it, that we ought to read the book in faith. We ought to memorize it. Today, I want to talk about how we ought to wait the book. W-E-I-G-H-T, how we ought to wait the book. I'm going to ask if we can. We throw it up on the screen. Let's read this together. Wait this book. Don't allow a fortune cookie, a quote from one of your favorite television shows, a post on social media, or a catchy slogan you saw on a t-shirt to hold equal weight on how you govern your life. In the battle of Christ and culture, Christ always wins supreme. Do not allow Satan to make scripture simply one of several viewpoints to be considered. The Bible is not a book to be placed on a shelf besides others. It is the word of God beside which there is no other. Anybody excited about the word of God? Amen. Well, come on, let's get into the word. Turn with me uh, to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Meet me there in verse number four. Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Meet me there in verse number four. Very significant very significant passage of scripture. I'm going to ask that you would, uh, let's read together. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. On the way to your seat, shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, God says, put your weight on it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your cooperation. You may take your seats presence of the Lord. The Spirit does speak and God does God. I want to use this as a subject for the next few minutes. Put your weight on it. Put your weight on it. I'm going to do something I typically don't do, which is to begin uh, this message with a definition. But it is significant. It is pivotal. It is foundational uh, to our understanding. And therefore, I'm going to beg your indulgence as I share with you a definition uh, of the word syncretism. Syncretism. Uh, this definition comes from the Dictionary of Bible Themes. The incorporation into religious faith and practice of elements from other religions, resulting in a loss of integrity and assimilation to the surrounding culture. And try that again. Syncretism is the incorporation into religious faith and practice of elements from other religions, resulting in a loss of integrity and assimilation to the surrounding culture. Brothers and sisters, syncretism is simply when you and I profess to be believers, but allow other religions, ideologies, and philosophies to influence and impact the way that we think. And and the problem with syncretism is that it violates the very first commandment that God gave to his people through the hands of Moses. Hear the word of the Lord in Exodus 20, 2 and 3. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have what? No other gods. What? Before me, beside me, around me. Now, if I was to ask you if you've allowed any other gods before Jehovah God, Jesus, you would, of course, say, no, Reverend, I'm sold out for Christ. But I would suggest to us that the real question of syncretism, whether you've allowed other things to influence your mind, is not the name or label that you put on your spirituality but rather it's the source of those things. In other words, belief in the one true and living God requires making primary space, placing as a priority and adding greater weight to the word of God than the opinions of everything and everyone. The Bible, the Holy Bible, the word of God is not to be placed on the shelf next to the television and the laptop and the radio and the ideologies of today's culture. No, the Bible needs to be on a shelf all by itself 
in a room all by itself, in a house all by itself, on a planet. Okay, it got away from me. Where I'm trying to get to is to get you to see that to the extent to which we've allowed other things to impinge upon our understanding of who God is, we have engaged in the process of syncretism. And may I suggest that from the pulpit to the last pew in the sanctuary, there is no one with credibility that cannot claim, that can claim to not have been impacted by other ideologies. Let the church say amen. amen. And the question is only to what degree have we allowed other gods before God? Okay, y'all look a little nervous. Let me see if I can do a quick uh, survey in the house. What if God says to go left? But the laws of the country or the state of the city say go right. What if God says go left, but your friends and family members say go right? What if God says go left, but the culture and social media and music and television say go right? Where I'm going with this is to get us to understand that all of us are impacted by influences that we oftentimes don't identify. Here, here's a great example of how syncretism works. Uh, it, I found it in uh, Mark Driscoll's book, A Call to Resurgence. And, and here's, here's, you ever heard somebody make this argument? Uh, you know, God is love and love wins. Here's the problem with that. John's declaration that God is love gets flipped so that love is God. And love means that God does not forbid anything or judge anyone. Never mind that mo the most commonly mentioned attribute of God in scripture is holiness. That the Bible speaks of God's wrath over 600 times with some 20 different words or that Jesus speaks of hell more than anyone in the Bible. Love wins, God loses. You see, when, we, when, we, when the Bible says that God is love, it speaks of the fact that one of the full attributes of God is love. But that's not his only attribute. He's also the God of justice. He's also the God of grace. He's also the God of mercy. And, and what I'm suggesting is that we've allowed the world's definition to color the word's definition of God's self-disclosure of a single attribute. Yeah. Holiness is an attribute of God. The, the, the full mercy is the attribute of God. In other words, here's another quote I found uh, in this book by G.K. Chesterton. He said, when a man stops believing in God, he doesn't then believe in nothing. He believes in everything. D.A. Carson explains how the definition of tolerance has changed from accepting that lots of people have different views, some of which are wrong, to agreeing that all views are equally true. Now, now that's just, that, that doesn't make good sense. I agree, everybody can have an opinion, but some people are dumb. And their opinions are not valid just because they have one. But when we buy in to the culture's understanding of tolerance, then we tolerate foolishness and place it on the same level with the word of God. Look at y'all all in your feelings. I said it and I meant it. You know somebody dumb? <laughs> Tickled myself. I was doing a list in my mind. Uh, the main threat... <laughs> To your faith is not when you don't believe in anything, it's when you believe in everything. For to claim you believe in God and also astronomy and ghosts and tweets and Wendy Williams and luck.
and love and energy is really to believe in nothing at all. Spiritual sounding ideas, catchy phrases, powerful emotional impulses, and intimidating cultural influence combine to create a brine of belief, a boiled down stew of ideologies, philosophies, and opinions which may taste good to the palate but come at an awful price. Can I beg leave to remind you that there was a man by the name of Esau whose hunger caused him to sell his eternal birthright for a bowl of sweet smelling stew. Listen, brothers and sisters, whenever we choose to sip from the sweet stew of secular spirituality, we are selling out our eternal kingdom birthright that Jesus purchased for us when he died and sacrificed himself on Calvary's cross. The question is not do you believe in Jesus? The question is what do you believe in addition to Jesus? See, when we attempt to make reasonable concessions with God's word based on science and popular opinion and our feelings, then we have already done much to unseat the primacy of the word of God in our lives. So, so, so what do you do when medical science says this is it for you or for one of your loved ones? Well, if you've placed all of your stock and hope in science, then you've got to accept science as the final answer. But when you believe that God has the final word on healing, whether science assists or not, then that means that if the doctor can't figure out you've got a second opinion, you can go to the word of God if you've allowed it to still be the word of God in your life and declare he was wounded for my transgressions and bruised for my iniquities and the chastisement of his peace was upon me and by his stripes, I'm here. got to be careful about how you allow other things to take space next to the word of God. But when you allow society and popular opinion to frame how you see yourself, but then you never see yourself the way God sees you. And, and so sisters, you spend an enormous amount of time frying and dying, liposuctioning and injecting trying to achieve an image that God never had in mind for you. And, and, and brothers, when you allow society to define manhood for you, then all of a sudden we see brothers wearing onesies as if they're children and wearing pedal pushers as if they're women or wearing their pants around their ankles as if they're gangsters. When God has made you to be a man, why don't you represent that, embody that which God had in mind when he formed you in your mother's womb? It's getting kind of quiet in here. And it's because you're in your feelings right now. Because we have allowed the, 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 the superficiality of a secular society to replace the power and the gravitas of the word of God. Well, I don't want to offend nobody. Why? Ain't nobody worried about offending you? Everybody's living their best life and living their truth and doing your thing. And you're the only one as a believer who's worried about other feelings. And while you worried about trying to offend somebody else, somebody in Iran will die today because they refuse to recant their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. While you trying to worry about other people's feelings, somebody in China is going to jail today because they were found in a place of worship. And yet you don't want to stand for the gospel lest somebody unfriend you on Facebook. Come on, I'm just saying that decisions have consequences and you ought to make a decision that I'm going to stand on God's word and whether you like it or not, I've made up my mind. I'm running with Jesus and I'm going all the way. Who am I preaching to? Is there anybody who can declare in 2019 that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's still the power of God unto salvation? 
you, you see, this ain't the first time this has happened. That there's been a people before who God blessed, who God delivered from slavery, who God granted promotion and prosperity to. And God knew what was going to happen. And so before he did all that, he said, now, when I bring it to a land that flows with milk and honey, and when you live in houses that you did not build, and, and when you drink uh, from cisterns you did not dig, and, and when you pluck down from trees that you did not plant, do not forget the God of your salvation. Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land. And now as he concludes his life in Joshua 24, he gives the people a stern warning because they did the very thing that God warned them not to do. As they came into the land of promise, even though God gave them the land, they began to adopt and adapt to the foreign gods that were customary in that land. And so in Joshua 24, 14 and 15, he declares, now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we shall serve. I'm trying not to shout on my own message, but I declare, I don't care what comes out and what is popular and what is acceptable. I can't speak for what's going on in the schoolhouse. I can't control what happens in the White House. But as for me and my house, we shall. I don't care whether you got 10,000 square feet or 10. The word of God. The reverence for God ought reign and rule in your house. Here it is. I'm just trying to show us that if we would only allow God's word to take primacy in our lives, the very things we think we're waiting on, we'd realize have been waiting on us. That, that, that God has provided for us a covenant relationship through which he superintends the affairs of our lives by obligating himself to the word that he's declared. Did you catch that? That God has a purposed plan for us, and the purpose is the plan is not a secret. He's provided it for us in his word, but it ain't just enough for me to read it. I got to put my weight on it. And this is the foundational concept that we look at here in this particular passage that we read a few minutes ago. That this, this text found in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 is not a normal scripture. In fact, you may not realize it, but this text is foundational to our faith as a part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. That is to say that Jews since antiquity have prayed this scripture at least twice a day every day. It's called the Shema, and it is significant for our understanding so much, so I'm going to ask that you would turn your attention to the screen. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Now, the first word of the Shema is hear or listen, which in Hebrew is pronounced Shema. That's where the prayer gets its name. Now, Shema is a really common word in the Hebrew Bible, and it's obvious why. Hearing is a very universal activity. It's usually connected with the ear, as in Proverbs chapter 20, ears that Shema and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. Now that seems basic enough, but if you look at the other ways that Hebrew authors can use the word Shema, they use it to mean more than just let sound waves enter your ear. In Hebrew, Shema can also mean pay attention to or focus on. So when Leah, who wasn't loved by her husband Jacob, she has a son and she names him Simon, or in Hebrew, Shimon, because she says, the Lord has Shamad, that I am unloved. 
So Shema means to hear and to pay attention to and even more. It can also mean responding to what you hear. This is why so many of the cries for help in the book of Psalms begin with a call that God listen. Psalm 27 verse 7, Shema my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful, answer me. So asking God to Shema is at the same time asking God to act, to do something. It's similar to when God asks people to listen. Like when the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, God says, if you Shema me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Now there's a couple interesting things about this verse in Exodus. In Hebrew, the word Shema is repeated twice in this sentence to give it emphasis. If you Shema Shema, meaning listen closely. But also notice that from God's point of view, listening is basically the same as keeping the covenant. So when God asks the people to Shema, what he means is that they listen and obey. And that's the last fascinating thing about Shema. In ancient Hebrew, there is no separate word for obey, meaning to carry out the wishes of someone who knows better than you or is in authority over you. So in the Bible, if you want to say, I will listen and do what you say, you use the single word Shema. In Hebrew, listening and doing are two sides of the same coin. This is why later in Israel's history, when the people were breaking their covenant promises to God, the Hebrew prophets would say things like, they have ears, but they're not listening. The Israelites, of course, could hear just fine, but they weren't actually listening or else they would act differently. And so in the end, listening in the Bible is about giving respect to the one speaking to you and doing what they say. Real listening takes effort and action, and that's the Hebrew word Shema. Wow, isn't that amazing? Shema, that, that singular word to hear is, is actually what refers to this entire passage. But, but to hear is not just to hear, it's to listen. It's to pay attention. It's to obey. And so when he says, hear, O Israel, he's saying, get prepared to follow into what I'm about to declare. That's what it means to put your weight on the word of God that when I read the word, I don't read it like I'm reading a novel, like I'm scrolling on social media. I'm reading it as if I am holding the very contents of the covenant that God has created for me to live in abundance and the kingdom life. So, so, so he says here, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord our God, so, so, so it gives, it discloses the speaker here that the one who created you, the one that is sustaining you and the one that will deliver you, this is the one that's talking. The Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Lord our God, the Lord is one. If God is speaking and God is one, that means that there can be no other gods before him or beside him. And since I know God through his word, since he is his word, then there can be no other words before him or beside him. Y'all not happy. Uh, I'm trying to show you the power of God's word. And if you're a parent, you know the truth of what I'm about to say. Let, let me see the parents in the house. Y'all made it to eight. God bless you. So. So, so parents learn early on, watch what you say around your child, particularly as it relates to promises, because every child is born with a supernatural gift to be able to recall and recite verbatim whatever that parent said that contained a promise. Am I right about it? No, mama, you said, no, daddy, you said, well, as a kingdom believer, you've got a heavenly father. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. I, I'm making you some promises and their promises are contained in his word. And if you got a good sense as a child of God, you ought to learn to hold on to every promise and to remind your heavenly father of what he has declared for your life. Is there anybody here that's ever had to pray the scriptures uh, that as you prayed you reminded God of God's word not that God has a bad memory but so that you could align yourself with the promise that he already has made for your life 
touch your neighbor and tell them, my God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. See, 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 some promises God makes are conditional. Here's an example. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked way. If you do your part, then God says, I'll do my part. I'll heal here from heaven. I'll forgive your sins and I'll heal your land. Some promises require our performance. But thank God there's some promises that are designed to demonstrate God's character. See, sometimes God just makes a promise just so you know he's God. He'll say something like, I am God, and beside me there is no God. I am God, and I change not. That means that no matter what else is going on or going wrong in my life, when you love me today and can't stand me tomorrow, when you say you're going to be with me today and then betray me tomorrow, I've got somebody in my life who is sure, who is consistent, who is immutable, who changes not. God gives us some cautionary promises, like be not yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? And here's my favorite. God makes some Christological promises. That is to say that God, through Jesus Christ, shows us the opportunity to live in full covenant blessing. If any man be in Christ... If any woman be in Christ, if any boy or any girl be in Christ, if any hood rat or hoochie be in Christ, if any thug or gangster be in Christ, if any addict be in Christ, he is, she is a new creation. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Jesus has made me some promises like I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place, I'll come again and receive you unto to myself that where I am you may be also y'all not hearing me Jesus made me a promise oh death where is thy victory oh grave where is thy sting the power of grave is victory and the power of sting is the law but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ Jesus made me a promise and I'm going to hold him to his word for God is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should repent I can't depend on on the Dow Jones average. I can't depend on the United States government. Shucks, I can't depend on myself. But I'm here today because I'm standing on the promises of God my Savior. Hear, O Israel. Hear, Shema, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. I'm done. But let me just show you real quick why that shows you you got to put your weight on the word. First of all, he says you got to love the Lord, your God, with all your what? All your heart suggests that my relationship with God is one of intimacy. That, that it's not theoretical. The problem with us is because we done read half a book and half a page on the internet, we think we're smart. And we think that therefore we can intellectualize God. But, but who can understand, who can divine, who can discern the mind of God? His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. God's desire is to be an intimate relationship with us that begins in the heart. For the word says, as a man thinketh in his what? Heart. So, he, so, so, so what that suggests to me is that God desires intimacy, into me see, that, that God desires transparency and connectivity in relationship with me, that at the end of the day, if I put weight on the word of God, the word of God provides access to my fundamental relationship in life. And once God becomes my primary relationship. It contextualizes every other relationship. It marginalizes every other relationship. That, that means that I love you, but my love for you is a reflection of my love for God. And because my love for you is a reflection of my love for God, when you act crazy, I can still love you. 
that that because my primary love relationship of intimacy is with God, that means that when my money is funny, I don't have to lose my mind because I did not become a lover of money. My love is in God, and I understand that money is only a means through which I navigate life. Are you hearing me? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. If, if the heart is the place of intimacy, the soul is my innate self. It is me at the core, me at the center. In other words, brothers and sisters, the soul in the Hebrew mind was the seat of the entire, the, the will. And that meant that one makes a decision to love God. A decision to wait his word. A decision to make him primary in life. And that decision gets into your very DNA. Now, I need to use an illustration, but in order for you to be able to say amen, I need you to be comfortable about the fact that you're going to tell on yourself to your neighbor. Okay? Now, I just need you to be comfortable that your neighbor is not going to judge you because you're about to shout and say amen about what I'm going to say. Now, you got to tell the truth, but if you tell the truth, you're going to co-sign. All right. So, so it's possible to go and consume, for instance, a beverage. And after one has consumed this beverage, even though you have not announced to anyone of the beverage that you have consumed, it is obvious to all who were in your vicinity that you've just consumed a certain beverage. In fact, if it's hot and you begin to sweat, the beverage will begin to ooze, the aroma of the beverage will begin to ooze. Out. You tell on yourself now, be quiet. The beverage will begin to ooze out of your pores and it's obvious to everybody that this beverage has gotten into your DNA. Can I tell you that when you put weight on the word of God and you walk in the room, it should be obvious to all that you have been a drinker of the word of God. It ought to ooze out of your behavior. It ought to ooze out of your language. It ought to ooze out of your lifestyle. Is there anybody here that can smell something on your neighbor and it smells like the word of God? Give somebody a high five and say, neighbor, you tell it on yourself. I gotta, gotta get out of here, cut across the field. Uh, should love the Lord your God. Gotta make him live, Reverend. Gotta make him live. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, intimacy, all your soul, the innate level, Thirdly and finally, and with all your strength. Now, isn't that an interesting conclusion? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This significant foundational principle ends with referring to strength. And I like that because strength means it's on me. If heart is about intimacy and if soul is about the innate level, then strength is about intensity. It's about how much I go after God, how much I yearn for God, how much I long for his word to have primary rule in my life. In other words, brothers and sisters, because this last piece is about strength, it means that it's on me to determine how much I move into kingdom living. That means that the devil in hell can't stop or block my thriving relationship with God. That means that they cannot pass any governmental regulation that can deter me from growing Growing up in the things of God, that means that no matter my money situation, I can still prosper in the things of God. It just depends on how much I want it, how intense I am going after it, how much weight I put on it. I, I'm done. I, I was I, I was uh, I was supposed to fix the back door uh, to the house several uh, several weeks earlier, and uh, and Sister Sean had told me to fix it, and uh, I had been derelict in my duty and. And now my daughter was about to get me in major trouble because she's trying to get in the back door and it's stuck and she's hot. Daddy! Daddy! The door don't open. Would you? Hey, hey! Man! Uh, what are we doing? And so without trying to give too much detail, I, I just said one thing to my daughter. Baby! Put your weight on him. 
And, and when she stopped trying to move it and she put her whole self into it, she went through the door. I come to tell somebody that God's got a door of blessing, but it requires more than tangential relationship and desire. It requires that you put your whole self into it, that you put your weight on it. And if you put your weight on the word of God, I declare that God will prosper you, that God will promote you. I need somebody in this house that's ready to put your weight. Come on, Redmond, let's ride. Give somebody a high five real quick and say, neighbor, in the name of Jesus, I come to declare that I'm putting my weight on the word of God. That's what worship and praise is about. Praise and worship is about the intensity of my expression, of my expectation, of the God of my salvation. Now, is there anybody here that wants to give God glory? Now, see, that's a perfunctory praise. Come on, get real and put your weight on it. Think about who God is. Think about where God has brought you from. Think about what God has done in your life. Open up your mouth and give him glory. That ain't no way. Come on, open up your mouth. Stop worrying about the people next to you. And if you love God because he first loved you, you ought to show some. Hallelujah. 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 You, you don't know how many times it's been a long week. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. And I say, I'm just going to go on there and get through my little outline, keep it moving. But when the word of God is weighted in your heart, the power of God takes over. And you just can't help yourself. Can't. Can, can I suggest you ought to put some more weight on the word? 